Hey, it's Jamie, and welcome to a selects edition of Eventual Millionaire. This is where we go back and find the best of the best, the ones that you loved from the past six seven years. We've been doing this a long time and there's some amazing interviews with amazing guests that you have not seen yet. So we are bringing them back. It is the Selects Edition. Let us know what you think and I hope you enjoy. Potent advice and inspiration from real self-made millionaires. Welcome to The Eventual Millionaire with your host, Jamie Masters. Welcome to Eventual Millionaire. I am Jamie Masters and today on the show, I am so excited to have Stephen Hoffman. You can check him out he created Founder Space. You can check him out at CaptainHoff.com, which I think is the best domain ever. He has had an epic career both in Hollywood and Silicon Valley. Thanks so much for coming on the show today. Jamie, it's fantastic to be here. Your career has spanned so much from Hollywood to Silicon Valley. You've done so many different things. You have two podcasts right now. How have you decided to change avenues so much? So I like to say I've had more careers than cats have had lives. So Hollywood, Silicon Valley, I'm a venture capitalist. I've also been a game designer, an electrical engineer, a manga rewriter, a voice, a voice actor, you name it. I've tried it in my lifetime. And that's just the, a scratching the surface of the many things I've done. But it, one thing has been consistent. So I've always been passionate about being creative, creative in business and creative in producing products, creating products. So my work with entrepreneurs that I do today is an extension of all that. I've done three, I founded three venture funded companies in Silicon Valley, two bootstrap startups. And I really understand what entrepreneurs are going through because I've gone through it. And today, running Founder Space, I coach literally hundreds of entrepreneurs around the world, and I see all the pitfalls they have, all the places they run into roadblocks, and I try to help them around those. So many people listening are like, I want to do that. I want to go from idea to idea. Normally, it's ADHD and squirrel, and none of them get off the ground. How did you actually make yours actually successful? Well, not all of them were. <laughs> let's let's be honest about this. You know, when you try a lot of things, stuff and you're really creative and experimental, they're not all going to work. However, I've had a lot, I've had more than my share of successes and the, there are certain things I do and I will tell you, and I write about this in my new book, Harper Collins just published it, surviving a startup because most startups fail because they don't do these things. So when you are starting a new venture, the most important thing is not your idea. Everybody thinks I have to have that epiphany, that brilliant idea before I dive in and become an entrepreneur or do some project. You don't actually. What you need to do, there are two things you need to do. And I'll first I'll tell you what you don't need to do. You don't need an idea. You don't need to go out and raise money. And you definitely shouldn't be building anything. The first thing, if you want to be successful, you should do is surround yourself with amazing people, like literally people who you, not, not people who you can get, who you happen to be available, but those people who you really admire, those people who have talents you don't have and compliment you. If you can build this team, your chance of success triples just instantly. Second thing you should do is don't think of an idea. Like this is counterintuitive. Instead, pick an area that your whole team, all of you together want to work on. And then you go into the real world and instead of trying to prove this brilliant idea in your head works in that, because more often than not, it doesn't, instead of proving this, you actually go into the real world and you start to what I call hunt for demand. Now, great ideas. Like you, you could have the best idea in the world. You could have the best team in the world. You could have the best product in the world. You could have all the money in the world. But if there is no demand out there for what you have, it'll go nowhere. So I, I will be, I'll give you an example. Let's say you uh, want to change the fishing industry and you want to do good. You see that there's a lot of bycatch. The fishing industry is very inefficient. The fishing industry is decimating our fish stocks around the world and polluting the oceans. Wow, there's a lot that can be changed. However, you could have the best idea in the world to change it, but if the fishing industry doesn't want it, it'll go nowhere. Like, 
it, it doesn't matter. They won't adopt it. So really great entrepreneurs say, okay, I want to change the fishing industry. Then they go into that industry and they start really understanding what the people in that industry want, what they need, and how new technologies or new processes or new business models could change how they do their business. And if they can align the goals that pent up demand in the fishing industry for certain things, like maybe they want to be more efficient, more profitable, you know, they want to do certain things, they want to accomplish things. And you can align those with other benefits that this new technology and new way of doing things does. Boom, you can unleash that demand and grow a startup. So don't go out there with your idea trying to sell it to people. Instead, go to where people are having pain, having problems, wanting something. And then you start to experiment with lots of different ideas and see which ones actually unlock the demand, like an oil gusher. That is the key to starting. Being actually open and flexible, which is hard for entrepreneurs, especially if they already have an idea, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> No, it, honestly, you too many entrepreneurs fall in love with their idea. Yes. And they fall in love. So they, first of all, block out every other possibility. They're not looking for other things. Once they've fallen in love, they just want to make this idea work. Secondly, they're trying to sell their idea to people who don't necessarily love it, but they're not listening to the feedback. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say with your team, pick a direction, not an idea. There's so many ideas out there. And honestly, I want to give you some examples. Like there are great companies out there and most of them start, did not succeed on the idea they started with. So look at Google, like Google, one of the most profitable companies in the history of humankind. When Larry Page and Sergey Brin started Google, they thought they were doing a nonprofit, a nonprofit, like it's ironic. But that was because their original idea was to help academics find research papers online. Like that was a nonprofit idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When, when you look at YouTube, when they started, their original idea was a video dating site. It was only, most people don't know it, no. but it was, that was failing. Like nobody wants to video date. So it was only later that when they, uh, they were running into problems with their company, it wasn't working. And then they, uh, they wanted to share a video file. Video files are large. And they said, oh, we built this platform where you can upload videos. What if we just shared the link? That simple idea became YouTube. On and on and on. You look at Skype uh, and you look at, I mean, Slack. The company Slack, that was a game. It was a game that failed. And then they had this internal messaging system that the engineers had built. That became the company. So when you're going into the world, don't fixate on the idea. Honestly, you will figure something out. It's a journey. You start walking the path and the path shows you which avenue to take on the scenic route, right? Right, because I have a rule, fundamental rule. Entrepreneurs can never manufacture demand. You cannot make somebody demand what you have, right? You can have, what, you can build whatever, but you, there is demand out there and your job is to find it. Okay. So this is a bit of a random question because I want to go into the, that space in just a second, but I have a client who I made just buy your book just right before our call, actually. She has a seven figure company and she has an idea and she wants to get investors for it. So I totally believe you on the feedback and getting more. She's got a big customer list. What should she be doing with that customer list and how should she be trying to get investors? So first of all, you need to understand your business. So certain businesses out there are investor friendly. They Investors love them. Other businesses, and they don't work for investors. So first, let me tell you, if her business is linear growth, like it's going to be steady growth, most venture capitalists, most big investors will not touch it. And you're like, why? Like she could have a great business, all these clients in it, but it's just going to grow steadily. Yep. And the reason is because those businesses, when an investor puts money in your company, the first thing that investor wants is to get their money back out of your company. And they don't want just what they put in. They want like tenfold. So how do they get that? They only get that if the company's growing exponentially. And because exponential companies tend to get acquired for lots of money or they can IPO. Linear growth companies, well, maybe 30 years later, something will happen. But most of these investors, they don't want to wait 30 years. That's it's too long. A lot of them might be dead. They're older. A lot, others have funds and the funds have lives that are usually, you know, not much more than 10 years. So they need to get their money back within that time period. So she has to look at her business. And if it's not right for getting investors, she shouldn't waste her time. 
honestly, it's not, it's just a waste of time. If the businesses that investors love right now in Silicon Valley and just in general, they want a company, first of all, that is not doing what everybody else is doing. If she is doing what everybody else is doing and has really no distinct core, what I call a core value that she is offering her customers that they can't get anywhere else, why should they invest in her? Because it's just, she's going to be competing at the end of the day on price and there's a lot of competition. What they want is somebody who's figured something out, usually through technology or a new business model or even a design innovation that allows people to do things radically different. And really, there are only two ways that a startup breaks out for exponential growth. One is that you do things exponentially better than your competitors. So it's like, oh my God, this is so much better. We can't keep using the old product. If it's incrementally better, nobody switches. Like we're not gonna switch. We're not gonna leave Gmail because there's another email software out there that has another feature. It's just not gonna happen, right? It has to be like, wow, this is so much better. The other way, is if you do something that they're not doing. You identify something that they need, they have this extreme need that they're just not getting, and you enable them to do that. So one of these two, and then they use your product usually in addition to whatever else they're using. So the, if she doesn't have one of those two, again, investment is out. Like the, the bar for investment is really high. And then the third one is there can't, there has to be a big market there. There has to be enough customers and enough demand to fuel this into a, a fairly large company, you know, hundreds of millions in revenue, billions of dollars in valuation. That's where investors make their money because they invest not, they don't expect every investment to pan out. Honestly, smart investors know they will always make mistakes. So they do it on a portfolio model, just like you do with stocks. And a few, and really in, in Silicon Valley, in a venture firm, they call that company that, that goes boom, that just takes off the Googles that they invested in, the Facebooks, whatever they are. Those companies are called fund makers. And they are happy if out of 10 or 20 companies, they have one fund maker. Because that one fund maker literally becomes worth more than all the other investments combined that they've done. So every bet that they place, every investment that they place, they have to believe your company or her company could be a fund maker. Yes. So she probably will not be going down that route like I, I assumed. How do you figure out the the feedback, though? Because there's lots of different ways right now of like talking to your customer and blah, blah, blah. What do investors want to see so they know you've sort of carved out your own space in, in your niche? OK, I write a lot about this in Surviving a Startup. Right. Really, um, investors, there are two things that investors want to see. So uh, actually, there are several things. I'll go into all of them. First of all, you catch investors by telling a great story. Honestly, people respond to stories. Everybody says they're analytical, but I know investors like they want a story that resonates because if it resonates with them, it's going to resonate with the customers. It's going to resonate with the press. It's going to resonate with employees. These things build on each other. So they they we understand the world through storytelling. So they want a great story, but a great story isn't enough. A great story and a great idea are not enough. The thing that they smart investors like you can sell. A, a stupid investor on just a story and an idea. You know, they'll invest in anything. But really smart investors, what they want is some sort of proof that they can extrapolate from that, yes, it meets my criteria. What solid proof? And there's really no more solid proof you can get than the customer, how the customer engages with the product. So if you're going out to customers at the very beginning, and your customers are, are looking at your product and go, oh, that's really nice. That's really nice. Come back when it's ready. And we'll we'll ad adopt this. Or that's great to have. As soon as somebody says that's nice to have, you are dead in the water. Like dead. Like nobody buys nice to have products. We all like use them. for You know all those apps you download on your phone? You download them. Oh, that's kind of nice. That's really nifty. You forget about it like the next day. And then a month later, it's deleted. That's what happens to nice to have products. So what you need when, when you go, when, when your investor, if they can talk to your potential customer, what they want to see is that your customer doesn't go, oh, that's nice to have. They're like, oh my God, I need this yesterday. I have to have this. How do I get it? Ooh, I'll pay for it. I'll do whatever it takes. Get me on board with this product. That is, they, that is the reaction they need. Because honestly, if 
what you're offering them isn't in their top five, like priorities, top five, they will never get to it. And honestly, the companies that really explode, it's in somebody's top three priorities. So whoever is making that buying decision, whether they're a person at a big corporation or an individual consumer, if it's not in their top three of things they want, they're just not going to deal with it. Like we're all too busy. So the biggest criteria is can you prove to this investor it's in their top three? A simple way before you even build the product is go out to your target customer if there are other businesses and videotape them or get testimonial or get them to actually write you a check, you know, in advance or do something that proves that this is in their top three, that they are going to take action on this. And you show that to investors. Other ways, crowdfunding, like people put these out on Indiegogo, Kickstarter, great way to show that consumers, before you build it with just a video, wow, they are putting up their money. They're putting their money where their mouth is. That is, uh, that identifies it. And in addition to that, Investors also want to see your business model, because I will tell you, if you have a model, even if people are nuts, like you put something up on Kickstarter and people go crazy and they're giving you money. We've seen companies like this fail over and over again. They have a spike where they sell a lot of these gadgets and then they just go away. Like you saw Pebble, the watch. It was a while. You know, they raised 10 million on Kickstarter. It's gone. Even uh, even Oculus that was founded, uh, they raised tons of money on Kickstarter. They got acquired by Facebook for billions of dollars. But honestly, if Oculus hadn't been acquired by Facebook, it would be failing now. Like it, it like Facebook has just been pumping money into that company. Wow. It's not a money maker. Like people buy it, but they didn't really need it. Now, what proves that a company uh, will really sustain itself is the, uh, the core business model. And that is recurring revenue. Mm. The hardest thing you ever do as a business is to acquire a customer. That it's the most expensive thing you do. It's the most difficult thing you do. Now, when you acquire a customer, you want to make sure that the customer doesn't just buy your product once and you never see them again. Because that means you have to go out and acquire another customer and another customer and another customer. The great companies of the world, and look out there at, at all the very best companies. The very best companies in the world have what's called recurring revenue. When they get a customer, they get that customer, they keep paying them over and over and over. Doesn't matter if it's Microsoft, if it's Apple, if it's Google, if it's Facebook, you know, Facebook does it through ads, but they are, they are always getting more money from their customer. And the second thing they do, which is really important, what venture capitalists want to see is that the, your business locks in the customer, your business makes it so that the more time, the more a customer's time they spend with you, the more they, money they spend with you, the more they engage with you, the harder it is for them to switch and move to another product. So the great products out there, like once you get your iPhone set up and everything, you know, you don't want to switch. Like you're like, you have your apps, you have everything. You just want to keep using it. When you go to Facebook, once all your friends are on there and you start posting and forming all these relationships, very hard to transport those to another one. You go to Amazon. Like once you get it all set up on Amazon, they're all the buyers and sellers. They're creating more and more value for everyone. The more buyers there are, the more value to sellers. The more sellers there are, the more value to buyers. That ecosystem becomes incredibly powerful. So you couple all the things I've been telling you with those things, you have a winning model for investors. Yeah, it's a recipe pretty much for exponential growth. You're like, I keep my customers and they pay me all the time. That's great. Yeah, yeah They exactly. never leave me. And then you know, the venture, it's very simple for them to do the math. They're like, wow, if I give you this money now, you acquire all these customers, you won't be profitable right away. But look, over five years, you're going to make a ton of money. So what about early adopters? So VR, I'm super obsessed with like the future of tech and stuff. So you'd assume that Oculus would be making money. I mean, it's taken forever for us to even get the technology this far. And, and where it's going is insane. So why are they failing? Like, or is it just early adopters? Tell me a little bit more about what you think about that. Okay. Yeah. So I am obsessed with technology too. And I have another book that just came out. I've been very prolific. Um, it is called the five forces that change everything. And it is all about these new technologies and how they're totally going to transform our world like completely. And I write a whole section on VR and AR aug virtual reality and augmented reality. Now I just dissed VR that Facebook bought because not because VR doesn't have potential, which it does. But because VR is still early, it doesn't deliver on the promises that people want. It's honestly just too bulky 
for most people to wear, too time consuming. And the UI, honestly, navigating it is not easy for the average person. Like I to pick up my phone is easy. Like I have a rule. It has to be brain dead simple. Like people don't want anything complex. Like if it's not just like everybody will gravitate towards the simplest way to get something done, that it, whether it's entertaining themselves, whether it's communicating, whether it's buying a product, they will do it the simplest way. VR simply doesn't meet that threshold yet. Or if it's not going to be the simplest, it has to be do something amazing that this device cannot do. So when you look at VR, the future of VR is in totally immersive experiences in the future. Experiences you cannot have on a phone, on a laptop, in any other way. These are experiences that are going to be, at some point, we're gonna get there. They are going to be as lifelike as life itself. Literally, whether it's virtual reality where you're completely immersed or augmented reality, you're layering over the real world. You know, we're gonna live in the future, and this is really cool, this will happen. We are gonna live in a layered world, a world where we have layers of reality, like you are in a room and that room might look different to me and different to you, even though we're in the same room, because our, our basically devices are going to be uh, reformatting the room, putting in information in certain places, maybe changing the colors, maybe changing our bodies will be avatars, our little physical bodies will be able to redesign an avatar. You won't, you know, you could buy very plain clothes because everybody's going to see you in this virtual space. It's going to be really a fascinating world out there. I call it a multimodal existence. Like you will be existing on many planes at once and so will other people. And then you'll find these intersections where you will gather and different people will have different personalities and literally different groups of your friends will see and interact with you different ways, even though you're in the same physical space as other people. So your business friends will see you in kind of business <laughs> attire, all yeah. formal, whereas your your punk rock friends will see you in the same, you know, walking down the street in yeah. a totally different way. So it's going to be very, very cool. Um, we're still a ways away from that. Like that value proposition is so compelling. People will do it. We know. But that value proposition, we just don't have the tech yet and the ecosystem yet to deliver on that. However, the th one of the things, and this is another piece of technology which is coming, um, which would just transform us, is brain computer interfaces. So right now we use, you know, we use our phones, very clunky devices. It takes a long time to do stuff on them. And, you know, we're tapping away. It's very slow. But there are companies out there, Elon Musk included, he's one of many, you know, he has Neuralink, there's Kernel, there's so many other companies out there that are now working on devices that can actually allow you to communicate directly from your brain to the internet. And if you think this is science fiction, it's not. It's like, it happens in the lab. So there are people who have had strokes and their, their body is completely paralyzed, but they have these uh, brain chips in their their heads, they can literally talk. They can text over the internet just by thinking. They can control an iPad. They can control a wheelchair. They can control a robotic arm. That technology exists today. We will get that consumerized, right? That will be commercialized for consumers in the coming years. And you won't necessarily need a chip in your brain. They are working on new technologies. DARPA's funding this. They funded the internet, the US military. They are funding a non-invasive, meaning no drilling holes in your skull, ways to have high speed two way internet connections. As soon as that happens, instead of iOS or Android, you're gonna have a brain OS. Somebody is gonna build a brain OS, totally transform this world, honestly. See this, I love this stuff. Our sci-fi novels are finally coming alive, right? But the, the timeline is really interesting, right? Cause it's so exciting and we talk all about it and you're like waiting and waiting for technology to actually catch up. And we have no idea how long it'll take. How can uh, business owners now sort of capitalize knowing this is where we're going? Because they might be building a business that might not exist in the future. Yeah, we've seen this happen over and over. You know, everybody had to jump on the Internet, first of all. Then they had to jump on mobile. And then everybody jumped on social networks. You know, what's coming next? You know, and how do you take advantage of it? You honestly... Being an early adopter sometimes works and it sometimes doesn't. Like you can jump on VR and you could have spent a lot of time and it is actually cool. VR today, if you try it out, is really cool. It's just not broad enough application and compelling enough for a mass audience. But for niche audiences, it's really cool. And for niche applications like business, app, there's a lot of uses for VR. So I'm not dissing it. It is... Um, there, it's here. It just hasn't. It's an the Atari mainstream. at this point, right? It's yeah, it's an Atari. Atari compared yeah. to what we're gonna get compared yeah. to the latest Sony PlayStation <laughs> yeah. Five. You know, it's not a Sony PlayStation Five. Um, what 
but Atari, even from day one, honestly, they, they nailed it. People love games. So we, um, how you can take advantage of it is one, when new things come out, try them. Like, honestly, don't be the last to try. You can gain a lot of traction just by being early. Now, don't invest huge amounts of time into them, but try them. Make sure you know about them. And if you see them accelerating, uh, pr proportion your time compared to the growth. Like if you see it taking off, boom, start investing a lot of time. Getting in early allows you to build your brand in a new space that isn't crowded. So that's really, really important. This is true of new, new social networking platforms that are popping up all the time, enabled by new technologies and new trends. Like if you get on a trend early, that could, trend itself without any technology or anything else we know can just propel a brand. Look at Lululemon, right? Like they, they just hit the yoga trend at the right time. Boom. You know, they didn't need special tech to do that. You don't need special tech, but you do need to be aware. Don't close off possibilities. It's really important. The entrepreneurs, the people that break through are always open, always sucking in these things, always experimenting, always interacting with other people. Even if you don't do it yourself, Surround yourself by people who are so that they can alert you. Oh, my God, you should be on this thing. And you're like, oh, if you if if Jan Janet says so, then I know because Janet's always on the latest stuff. I love that. As, what's so difficult with business owners right now that don't have a lot of time, right? So because, you know, not all of them are startups. So a lot of people are like working 50 hours a week and sort of chugging along going, OK, it's kind of good right now, right? And and they stay up to speed on like the, the new technology. What do you suggest for somebody like them? Because they might want to go somewhere else, but they, they're, they're holding this big rock on their shoulder that they can't necessarily just go somewhere else, right? How, how would they be able to do sort of both of them at once? That is a challenge for everybody. It doesn't matter if you're in the tech industry, if you're uh, you know, a consultant, if you run a family business, you we never have enough time. Like we never have enough time. I'm like, I don't have enough time to do even check out all these new platforms. Like every day we're being bombarded with something new. Um, you can't always have enough time and you are not always going to be the first one to try it out or even in the beginning. But there are certain things that I recommend you do prioritize anything that can automate your business, anything that can save you time. Like we know time is your most precious thing. Save you time. So, you know, right now, the calendaring apps like Calendly are really popular and they just exploded overnight, like literally overnight. Why? Because they hit that extreme need. Like all of us, like we were wasting so much time doing that. I tell entrepreneurs the biggest thing you can do to impact your business. Now, there's all these new kind of fun platforms out there. Those are hard to know, right? Those require a lot of time. But anything that comes that you hear about other people using, and you see other people using them that can save you time, just invest the money. Do not hesitate. Those things deliver exponential returns. Even if it's a little time every day, adds up to a huge amount of time. And that, like you said, then you have more time actually to think about ways to improve your business. And I'm going to give people other advice. Like if you really want to innovate, if you really want to get ahead of your competition, which is what I think you're saying, like you want to innovate, the way to do it is to go to your customer, go to your customer, not once, not twice, not once a year, but early and often and always ask them, what are things that you would want that we're not giving you or no other people aren't giving you? What do you want? What do you need? And listen to them. A lot of times they won't tell you what to develop, like what product or service to, to offer them. But a lot of times they'll just tell you the outcome. They'll be like saying, you know, when I do this, it's hard for me to keep track of everything. And then you're like, oh, they want to be able to keep track of things in our flow that we're, we're I'm servicing them. How could I make that more efficient? How could I make it more transparent for them? Then you don't have to develop new technologies. Like these technologies are out there. There's project management softwares that are out there like Asana. There are uh, just simple things like Google Docs and spreadsheets that you can literally make shared online and you can have one of your assistants list all the things that they that are going on so that they have visibility into it and, and they can keep track and check it off and you, and you can see what they're doing. They can see what you're doing. Just simple things like that can totally differentiate you from a competitor. Like so both of you offer exactly the same services, let's say, but you offer a way 
you figured out that your your customers want transparency. They want to be able to track things. They want uh, timely updates. They want the and you use these really basic technologies that you didn't develop. You just use to actually give that to them. And then they're like, oh, we love you, you know. And once they love you, that's your best marketing you can ever get. Yes, it's like not rocket science, but still, a lot of people won't do it. Do you recommend surveys? Do you calling people on the phone? Do you have sort of a system for this? I, it can I get hate crazy. surveys. Okay. I hate surveys. First of all, surveys limit you yeah. because you are putting down what's in your head. So you're not getting at what's in their head. Like everything on your survey list might not be anything that they actually care about. And honestly, when I get a survey, I either ignore it or I fill it out super quickly. Yeah. You have very few times, unless it's a close friend, that will actually take the time to really give accurate responses. So my gut feeling is surveys are worth a little, maybe on a mass scale, like if you do a huge, but for smaller businesses, you know, just talk to them. Like, honestly, whenever you're engaged with them, ask, give them time to tell you what's in their head. Mm -hmm. You know, are there points that are frustrating you? Are there things that you need? You know, where, uh, what would you like to have happen in the future? What outcomes would you like? Like what, you know, what would really benefit you and you, your life or your business? And, and if you listen carefully, and then you come back to your team and you start discussing, we'll list all these things out that our customers are saying. Are there ways we could deliver these? Are there new or, or even existing or old technologies and platforms that we could use in new ways to actually get them to, 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 to deliver this value? At the end of the day, I always say your job is to deliver more value to your customers than anyone else so that they can't leave. And you look, uh, someone like Amazon, you know, Amazon, we all use Amazon. Why do we use Amazon? Like we could switch to another online store. It's not that hard. It's a click away. Why do we use Amazon? Well, Jeff Bezos was brilliant. He literally said, I am always, no matter what, I'm going to deliver more value than anybody else. He was the first one to pioneer free shipping. You know, he was just like free returns, like free shipping, free, re make returns super easy. Even if it costs us money, people thought he was nuts when he did the returns, making it easy. Everybody, like in the old days, they would hide. They would make it as difficult as possible to return a product because it costs them money. Jeff Bezos took the opposite approach. Why? Because his guiding principle, I'm going to add value. If I add more value than anybody else, they won't leave. They can't leave. Like, <laughs> and, and in your business, you should be doing the same. Yes, he has trained us very well. I know I can't go anywhere else now. How do you know how many are statistically significant, though? Because like you could get a bunch of customers, you could talk to 20 of them and be like, oh, well, two of them said the same thing or 20 of them said the same. Like, is there a specific number that you use to know that it's actually statistically significant? Yeah, if it's one customer with a very specific problem that only applies to that customer, you don't want to waste like two months reorganizing your whole business to service that one problem. You really need to find out if other people have that the same concerns or the same desires. So, and, and you need to filter those out. So that's part of the process. So part of the process, the first thing is to get them to talk to you, right? To get that information down. Then once you start seeing a pattern of customers and there, and when you say st statistically significant, it depends on the size of your customer base, right? So if two customers say it out of 200,000, that's not, that's nothing. But if you have four customers and two say it to you, well, you've just, just hit 50% and you want to grow your customer base, you know, to 20, maybe there are a lot of other customers who need that. Then you need to go out to potential customers if you don't have them and get a number where you start to feel confident that, wow, this isn't an aberration. It's, it's, a, it's a pattern. And, and there are enough customers out here to justify whatever the, it's a, if it's a small change, you could just make it right. If it's something that'll take you a couple hours and it makes your customer happy, just do it. But if it's something that's going to take a significant amount of work, then the bar goes up like a much higher percentage of your customers need it. And it's not just that they need it. They have to, it has to be really important to them. Right? So like I said, if it's just a nice to have to them, well, if it's easy to do, do it, right? You always want to be nice to your customers. But if it's hard to do, find out the things that are really important to them. And that it re inquires, that requires you to dive deep, maybe going back to the same customers over and over and over to figure out whether this is really one of their, uh, 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 you know, something that's going to affect their decision to stay with you or move to another partner in the future. That's Perfect. the answer. That's what, that's what I was looking for, because if you already have a customer, they're already paying you. They're going to go, yeah, I want that, too. Sure. Give me that, too. And that's that nicety where I'm right. like, why Ooh. wouldn't they? Like, yeah. if it doesn't cost them anything, give me, give me, give me. Yeah. Um, it, and again, you're only going to be able to charge more like you don't want people to compete with. the. Uh, you don't want to compete on price at the end of the day. You want to compete on value. 
right? So a lot of us are willing to pay a significant premium if we know the person is reliable, they, they're communicating well, they do, you know, they're tr trustworthy, all these different things. So as part of your package, you need to be, they need to be able to, this has to be important enough to them that ultimately you, your value increases and you can raise your prices because your prices shouldn't be dependent on what the market is. They should be dependent upon what your, what you value you're delivering to the customer. And you need to make sure that the customer understands that up front and uh, it's part in whatever they're asking you to change really affects that. Yeah, the only way you'll know what the value to the customer is is no as asking them what value <laughs> it is to them. We could make up everything in our head and be like, they're gonna love this, and that's why people. Yeah, they're gonna love. Time. Maybe you, you may well be overvaluing uh, what they're saying, so you need to you need to it, it. But look, if you are always engaging with all your customers and all your potential customers, and if a potential customer goes to somebody else, don't just let them go. You should have a follow up call and be finding out why did they choose that other person, what, what did they choose it just on price or were there some value that that customer was providing that we did, we're not providing like really important stuff. So, you know, the data is all out there. The information is all out there, but the, the people who build the great businesses that you're like, how did they do that? They're pulling in millions of dollars, like, you know, every year and I'm only pulling in, you know, six figures. How did they do that? Well, they did that by being smart, right? By actually, you know, always engaging with everybody they meet at a not a surface level, at a very deep level, taking advantage of those opportunities. They're detective. They get really good at detective work, exactly. right? It's already there. And, and, you know, and they use every touch point that they have with their customer, not just to kind of go through the routine that you always go through, but every touch point, every time they're touching a customer, every time one of their employees is, they have it drilled in their head that this is a discovery process. We are not just servicing them or delivering something to them. We are figuring out more stuff about what we can do for them, what they need, and we're gathering data. And then you have a process to incorporate and analyze and evaluate that data. And that is opening up where the path goes. So whether you turn yeah, left exactly. or whether you That's turn right. Exactly. That's when you, you know, these ideas, a lot of people think you should have an epiphany. These ideas never come out of thin air. They never do. They come out of, uh, out of a disciplined interaction. Like if you're going to consistently, you know, randomly you could come up with good ideas. But if you're going to consistently improve and iterate on your business, which is what, if you want to earn more money, this is what you need to do. Then it comes from every, it's, it's a systematized process that you have to put in place. I love all of this because I love data and it's much easier <laughs> if you just get the data and then do what they say instead of being like over here and over there. And I get the creative process can be a lot of different things, but when yeah, you, you don't want to just be reacting, that's yeah. right. You want to be putting every time, every time one of your team uh, is gathering this, you have a whole play, a whole a database or a, a, at least a simple spreadsheet online where you are recording it and, and measuring it against everything else. And that's when you see the patterns. You know, this is what makes AI so smart. Like humans are actually not good at this. Like we are not good at seeing these patterns. We are somewhat good. We're better than other animals on the planet. You know, that's, that's saying a lot. No, <laughs> no we're yeah. pattern matched machines. Yeah. AI takes it to a whole new level. So that's why when I there's other things like you want technology, you know, look for AI that can find these patterns. These are that's why AI is making businesses smarter. Mm -hmm. It's doing exactly what we're talking about now, gathering data and looking for patterns. It's doing exactly that on a on a very deep, massive scale. Way better than we ever could. Where does the yeah. creation come in though? Like I know you're talking about being creative and creation. Where where does that come in if all we're doing is sort of a feedback loop? Ah, where does creation come in? Create cr a creative process is when you are engaged curious and experimental. Now, creation doesn't mean like you're an artist just splashing paint on something, you know, that's not being creative, you know, or, or sitting and dreaming up a story. But really, really great creators are people who are disciplined and they are disciplined, but they are also very open to new things. And they are always in in whatever they do, designing new experiments to figure out what works in the world. Like, think about it. Even artists that are successful, some break through randomly, right? But you know the story of the starving artist. For every artist that breaks through, there are, you know, 10,000 that make no money at all, right? So you I don't want to have- art major, so yes, you don't, I, yeah, okay, that too. Okay, <laughs> but you don't want to have those odds, no. right? So that's kind of just, well, it's a, it's a statistical thing. But there are certain artists who are kind of destined to break through, 
And those artists like are great promoters. <laughs> they are always looking at the market. They are always trying new things and they are looking like, you know, they do exactly what we're talking about in business, but in art. And you're like, how did they break through? Like, how did Andy Warhol break through? He surrounded himself with amazing people. He like tried all these different things. Then he mass produced it on a systematized way. All his, you know, his, his, his artwork. And, and he used the media. He like, he was destined to break through. Um, in your business, when you are doing this, you have to uh, take, you ask like, how do you be creative? Everything you do is creative. If you are curious, if you are experimenting, it is creative. Like it doesn't have to be, you know, something else. It is creative. As long as you are asking questions, you're going in and you are pushing deeper and deeper. Always be learning. Like great, um, being creative is about learning and then synthesizing that knowledge and trying things based on that knowledge that you otherwise wouldn't have done. That is creativity. Man, I love conversations like this. Okay, I know we have to start wrapping up though. So hopefully you'll come back on the show at some point so we can go even deeper and talk about all the sure. other books. You also have a podcast called Mentors and Masters, which is like, of course, that's amazing. Everybody should go check that out. But what is one action listeners can take this week to help move them forward towards their goal of a million? Ah, so one action. I've already given you like 20, but I will give you one more action that you could take to move forward. And that is personal. So we've talked about all the things you can do with your business. Now let's talk about what you can do with yourself. There, I always say, if you aren't learning, if you aren't challenging yourself to learn new things on a daily basis, you are missing out. And by challenging yourself, I mean not going to all the same sources that you've always gone to. It means areas, domains that you don't know a lot about and exposing yourself to them. So for example, you're a business person, you're a consultant, uh, you're a small business owner or a big business owner. What about psychology, human psychology? Do you know much? Maybe you took that course, that one uh, elective in college, but really do you know that a lot probably has changed since then and there's a lot more? You could just get some books out now, right now on psychology, go to a, a seminar, go online. There are a lot of people and figure out psychology of, of people. And then it will start to open doors for you. Sociology, you know, design and design thinking. Do you know anything about, I'm not asking you to be a designer, but the whole process of design thinking is absolutely fascinating. Creating user experience, customer experiences. Wow. You can, you can. The beauty of the internet is all this is there. It's all there on TED Talks. It's there on YouTube. You can download audiobooks. And I download literally audiobooks. I do at least one audiobook a week. I do it at double speed because I'm sucking in information. And I do it as I do chores and exercise. So it takes up actually no time uh, uh, you know, because I'm a busy person. And I'm still feeding my brain. You know, travel. You know, if you if you've never gone to the opera, just go to the opera, right? Like, who knows? Like, Great thinkers, and Einstein said this, coming up with truly great breakthroughs is called combinatorial play. And the more things you can combine from different disciplines coming in, the more new ideas you will get. I feel like I need to drop the mic after that one. That was awesome. <laughs> Everybody go get an Audible book. One of, one of the new books that just came out, we will definitely link to them. But where can we find more about you and follow you on social? Sure. You can, I'm super easy. Go to founderspace.com. And when you come there, we have lots of free material, lots of videos of me talking and different things. My books are there, you know, Make Elephants Fly, Surviving a Startup, The Five Forces, they're all there. And you can reach out to me also on social. So LinkedIn, I'm on all the social networks. LinkedIn's probably the most easiest. Search for Steve Hoffman, Founderspace, you will find me. Awesome. And now I have to add you also. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jamie. If you enjoy this show, I would really appreciate your wonderful words of feedback. Go leave me a review. I would love a rating. Whatever you can do in the time that you've got, I would so appreciate it.